Angelina Jolie, her film career, the fact that her dad is John Voight. Uh, she's, of course, in a long, long time relationship with that pit guy. And she has adopted much of Western Europe uh, and a number of other continents, too. However, she's in the news about something that can have a great impact, can have a terrific impact on a lot of you. And I'm asking Dr. Mike Janicek to join us, Dr. Janicek, uh, in, uh, in practice here. In fact, why don't you just tell everybody about your practice as an oncologist? I'm a gynecologic oncologist, so I deal with female cancers below the belly button. I don't deal with breast cancers. But I'm also the medical director of our genetics risk assessment center. So I wear two hats, and I'm passionate about the whole world of genetics. I think this has been a huge story. I think part of the story has been told wrong, so I hope you and I will set that straight today. But it's a fascinating story, and it's a huge message to get out to the public. Well, let's start straightening things out right now. Why did Angelina Jolie choose a double mastectomy, and were there other options? Absolutely. Well, let's take a look at her family. Her mother had breast cancer, but she died of ovarian cancer. Her mother's mother, her grandmother, died of ovarian cancer. So the first thing that's different or didn't really get presented well with the story this week is that it's a lot about breast and ovarian cancer, but the ovaries, I call them the forgotten twins, have really been forgotten in the story. Now, of course, I'm a gynecologic oncologist, and that's my focus and passion, but I represent all of my patients who fought for their lives and died, and the message just does not get out in the public because we're a breast-centered society. The first news story that came out was about her breasts. Everyone talks about breasts. I've looked at all the news releases. I've been on the Internet. It's fascinating. There's very few stories that mention her ovaries. Now, on Tuesday when this story came out, it was all about her breasts. Then yesterday they talked about, yes, she's going to remove her ovaries. So I'm here today to talk about both, if you like, but I think we need to talk about ovarian cancer as well because it's actually the more deadly of the cancers. We can talk about anything that saves lives here. Absolutely. So when it comes to that genetic element, what is it called? Well, we're talking about the BRCA, B-R-C-A mutation. B-R-C-A. And, yeah, and it's a misnomer. It stands for breast cancer, B-R-C-A. It should have been called B-R-O-V for breast ovarian. But back in 1994, when it was first discovered, they just came up with the name BRCA, and it stuck with everyone. But it really should have been called B-R-O-V or BRAV. But there's not even just a BRCA simply. There's BRCA1 and BRCA2. There's as BRCA1 I and BRCA2. And we don't even have time today to talk about all of the other hereditary cancer mutations, Lynch syndrome for colon cancers. You can invite me back another day for those. But, you know, the breast and ovarian are the most prevalent and important ones to talk about, the most commonly tested. And yes, there are two genes, uh, but they're very similar in that they're, you know, we all have these genes, you and I good copies from mom and dad. It's when you inherit a bad copy that things can go bad. And for the same mutation, you could either get breast cancer or ovarian cancer. And if you had the mutation, you could actually get male breast cancer, believe it or not. You'd be at an inc increased risk for prostate cancer and even uh, pancreatic cancer to some extent. But the breast and ovarian one is the one we talk about most, but there's other nuances and other risks. And, and while I'm on that, if I forget to say anything else today, it's not just about women. Men can pass it along to their children. Men can get breast cancer, but it's uncommon. But when we look at family trees, a lot of healthcare practitioners make the mistake of just focusing on mom's side. Now, in Angelina Jolie's case, it happened to be her mother and grandmother. But if you look at the Gilda Radner story way back when, oh. she died of ovarian cancer, but her mother had breast cancer. But they got it from her mother's father. So they got it from a, a, somewhere along the line from the father's side of the family. So. It's always important to, when you're at, talking about family history to always know your father's side of the family, not just think, oh, it's a woman's cancer, it's breast ovaries, we're only going to focus on the women's side. And Gilda Radner and Angelina Jolie, both young women. Absolutely. Uh, Gilda died at the age of 39 or 40. So when you're talking, though, about a positive assessment, if a woman goes in uh, to her specialist and he comes back with the bad news, uh, that she tested positive. What's her first step? Can we backtrack a little bit? Before Please. you see your doctor and about test results, look at your Thanksgiving dinner table. Look around your family. Think about your family. Use the sniff test. There's all these guidelines of you have this many relatives at this age with this cancer. There's all these complicated guidelines. Forget about the guidelines. Look at your family and say, you know, we got a lot of cancers in the family. I have patients telling me, I think I'm next. I got breast and ovary and prostate in the family and pancreatic. If you, if you use the sniff test and there's a lot of cancers in your family, either you believe in bad luck or there's something genetic going on. 
So before we talk about the test results, people, everybody should ask their family uh, about cancers. And my own example, my dad had prostate cancer at 58. It wasn't until he got cancer that the family said, oh, you know what, his father also had cancer. It was all hush-hush. A lot of families don't like to talk about cancer. There's a lot of secrets. Get it out in the open. Know your family history. Talk about cancer. So that's step one. Then when you walk into the doctor's office. Hold on office, just a moment. Back up before we leave the family. With the reality of today's society, there are a lot of people who really don't know their families and they don't know their family's history. So then what? Well, let's say you're adopted and you don't have family history. Uh, there's not much you can do. But I've had patients of mine who get early onset ovarian or breast cancer and they're adopted. And we go straight to testing them because you don't know the family history. Mm -hmm. So. Yes, there is a role for testing, but we're not going to test everyone in the world with, you know, you have to look at the family and the risk factors, and then you hone in on who should be tested. But you're right. If there's missing information on the family, we're more likely to do the genetic test than err on the side of saying, well, we just don't know. And please go ahead with where you were going. Well, so I, I just wanted to emphasize, know your family history, know both sides. Don't just look at the female side, and don't keep secrets in the family. You know, it's, it's surprising to me how uh, it's hard for me to get a good family history from patients because they'll say, Oh, my mother, you know, my aunt had this cancer. Oh, yeah, my cousin had this. You know, it takes a while. And I think maybe everyone should have a pedigree written out. You know, that's what our genetic counselors do. It's, you know, it takes a lot of time to put it together. But some people tend to spend a lot of time with genealogy and drawing out all their family trees and their ancestry. It's the same thing with cancer risk assessment. That pedigree is so valuable to looking at the bird's eye view and helping us determine, are you at risk for this cancer syndrome? You know, breast ovarian is actually part of Lynch syndrome, too. So it gets very complicated and nuanced. And then the other thing that led to your question, you know, ask your family. When you talk to your doctor, make sure they know about genetics. I, had, I hate to say this, but the average practitioner, it is, it's such a complicated field. There's so much explo explosion of information. Make sure when you talk to someone that they actually know genetics. And if they don't, politely ask to be referred to someone that does if you are worried about uh, hereditary cancer. So by the very fact, though, that this is in the news, whether it's complete or even totally accurate all the time, at least people are talking. They're going to listen now. It's going to be so much easier for me to explain to patients why we want testing done, because Angelina Jolie did it. I mean, we've been doing this for 17 years now, but we're having a hard time getting the message out, because when you say the word genetics, people you know, shrivel up and they don't want to hear about it. But she did a bold thing. She came forth. She had her breasts removed, which is a very shocking thing, you know, but in many ways, uh, she absolutely did the right thing. I think she could have done things differently with the ovaries first. We can talk about all those things. But I think her, her, her family and what she did is very illustrative of what you can do in modern times. And it's a good thing what she did. And you're going to have to come back and talk about the good things everybody can do in order to stay healthy from the position that you have as a gynecologic oncologist, Arizona Oncology and Medical Director of Genetic Risk Assessment at Scottsdale Healthcare. This is Pat McMahon on the Morning Scramble. We hope we've been of service.